Chuck. Uh, good morning. I'm Frank Hesterman. It's my privilege to introduce this distinguished panel. I've looked at all their bios, and rather than say anything about myself, other than I'm probably the oldest InfraGuard member in the room, but uh, I've found that these four people, with all their important responsibilities, all contribute some of their time to youth education, mentoring, and development, which I thought was really quite remarkable considering their busy lives. Uh, the order that we're going to follow, we'll have a five-minute per panelist protocol, followed by a minute or two where panelists can ask questions to each other or to add comments that they maybe now could remember when they previously forgot. Uh, and then we'll throw it open for questions from the audience, and please introduce yourselves with your questions, and we'll try to get answers for you. The order of the uh, speakers, and raise your hands because you're not in the order that we had you on the list. Uh, the first speaker is Thomas McClellan, Director of Homeland Security and Public Safety Division at the National Governance Association. He'll be the first speaker. Uh, Bill Waddell, Director of Mission Command and Cyberspace Group, Center for Strategic Leadership and Development, U.S. Army War College, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Thank you for coming down here this morning. Trent Tyma, FBI Washington Field Office, Special Agent in Charge of Cybersecurity, former Director of Cybersecurity Policy, White House National Security Staff. And Montana Williams, Chief National Security Education and Awareness, uh, responsible for the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. Our first speaker is Th Thomas. Great. Thank you, Frank. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's tough to follow all the technical panels because I don't know anything in terms of the, the science of all this. Um, but let me tell you what my area of focus is. So I work with an organization called the National Governors Association. We are, we're an organization that's comprised of the 55 governors uh, out in the states. And I oversee what's called the Homeland Security and Public Safety Division. And in my role, I get the opportunity to work directly with governors, as well as their Homeland Security advisors, some of their emergency managers, adjutant generals, criminal justice advisors, around a range of issues. And uh, I've got a short time here, but I want to provide to you an overview of a project that we launched about a year ago under the leadership of Governors O'Malley from Maryland and Governor Rick Snyder from Michigan. It's called the, the State Resource Center for Cybersecurity. The idea was that there's a lot of discussion taking place, and I'm going to tie it into some of the earlier discussions we heard earlier, uh, before. There's been a lot of discussion around cybersecurity taking place, but it's all, frankly, been focused at the federal level. You have DOD protecting the .mil space. We have DHS protecting the .gov space. But there hasn't been a role yet carved out for states, for governors. What should they be doing to... Um, protect their their own assets. What they what actions should they be taking to recover? And so, with that in mind, we launched the the resource center with that notion of filling that policy void for governors, for state actors, because from our perspective, they are an essential player to mitigating, to responding to, and protecting from any type of cyber attack, even if it's in the hands of a privately owned critical infrastructure. And I know that's the the topic of today's theme. Um, and, and so toward that end, we've spent, um, we put together a, a group of, an, an August group of folks who have helped us think through what is it that governors can be doing. And governors are busy. They think high level. They think strategic. And so what we've issued is a call to action. We issued earlier this month, or rather earlier this year, uh, at an event at Capitol Hill. Uh, Governor Snyder came down from Michigan. And we call it a call to action for governors on cybersecurity. And we recommend that states take five basic steps, and we call it act and adjust. It's the notion of don't let perfect be the enemy of, of good and done, and not done, maybe just, maybe just good. Because right now, um, the challenge is that the, the, the threat landscape is ever-evolving, it's ever-changing, and there are things that states can begin to do now to effectuate as forward-leaning a cybersecurity posture as possible. And so that's the mission space we're in right now. We're looking at posture. We will eventually move to looking at response issues, which takes us to the discussion here today. We don't care at NGA if it's an EMP, if it's, a sol if it's solar weather, if it's seismic, if it's a cyber attack with respect to the electrical grid coming down for any prolonged period of time. What we're going to begin to look at and, and, and are starting a process within NGA that's going to probably um, 
uh, align itself with our Cyber Resource Center is this notion of response. How do governors, A, understand the primary, secondary, and tertiary impacts of a massive and prolonged failure of the electric grid? But then what are the response? That mission space is, space is also undefined. Right now, um, it, it, one of the major concerns among Homeland Security advisors is this notion of catastrophic planning. What happens if something really big goes off in New York City? How do you evacuate Manhattan? How do you get the hospitals out? So the corollary to that is what happens if the grid goes down? We had a, a um, not a corollary of that, but a part of that. So we had a governor's only discussion back in summer of, of this year. And one of the discussions that we had was this notion of the response to Sandy and, and other major catastrophes, tornadoes and so forth. And one of the con top concerns for governors is energy assurance. And you know, without, without electricity, you have no comms after, after a certain amount of time. You have no fuel after a certain amount of time. You can't heat, you can't cool. And so it's really been a major issue. And Sandy was big, but it isn't as big as some of the things that, that, are, that are possible out there. You know, one of the biggest threats I think that we face as a nation with respect to cyber, in addition to the financial, is this notion of the electric grid being taken down or, or, or seriously impact, impacted. So we're going to be looking at NGA um, to provide governors with advice, with resources. We're helping states right now um, improve their cybersecurity posture. The thing is called the call to action. Um, I, I think I got like maybe 30 seconds left. I'll just tell you the five actions that, that we've We've at, we're advocating for states. One is this notion of creating a risk awareness culture. Two is this notion of understanding your own risk, your own threats, your own vulnerabilities. Three is really improving how you, um, you do continuous threat monitoring. Um, then there's also this notion of applying uh, standard business practices. In particular, what we point to the, the, the SANS top 20 critical controls. It's no longer SANS, it's now Council on Cybersecurity. So th th there is a document, it's high level, it's focused on governors, it seems light, but it's not. It's, it, it is a strategic piece that we have put together for governors. It's really that notion of, uh, of improving the posture. We are gonna be looking over in 2014 to begin to look at response issues. So I hope that uh, helps set a little bit of the stage about where, we, where, where our thinking is at the NGA and, and um, really looking to expand the role of governors and states. Thank you, Thomas. <clears throat> Bill, please. Well, good morning, and I bring you a greeting from the Army's best-kept secret, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, home of car shows and the Army War College. Uh, great place to be from, and uh, I always remind myself that uh, working in Carlisle, the worst day in Carlisle is a 10-minute commute with one stoplight. So when I come to, uh, come to D.C., it always gives me that perspective of where I work. So anyway, just, just glad to be here today. When I was asked to look at the most important issue or the top issue that DOD faces in terms of its relationship with the private sector, um, I have to admit I spent some time trying to figure out which one would be the top one. Um, but I came... Uh, to the decision that I think that the biggest concern in DOD concerning this whole area of cyber protection and, uh, and, and the private sector has to do with the authorities and the relationships that go with this Department of Defense group of folks. I mean, uh, DOD is constrained very much by law as to what it can and can't do in terms of reaction or how it works with private citizens. Uh, there are lots of things, lots of capabilities, lots of uh, uh, folks just up the road in Fort Meade that, uh, that have lots of capabilities, but unfortunately they are very constrained with how they work with the private sector. Uh, there are two support missions that would go uh, working together with uh, Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security when these issues happen. One of those would be uh, the Defense Support of Civil Authority, or DISCA, for those of you who are familiar. Uh, this is coordinated through Department of Homeland Security, and it is in support of DHS's um, coordination themselves, being that DHS is the coordinator of all those issues. But some of the areas we found in our series of war games and, and some issues that we've uh, discussed with the private sector is there's still a belief that if the whole town of Carlisle would come to Carlisle Barracks, 
that the cavalry would indeed ride over the hill and save them from this imminent problem that, uh, that they face. Of course, that's not true. We're not in a society of civil defense. We don't have uh, rations. We don't have water. The DOD is dependent upon the private sector for its energy generation. It does have some generators. It does have some capabilities. But in a couple of days, they're going to be just as dependent as the private sector is. Uh, and then you get into this area of authorizations where, again, DOD really cannot do anything, can't even share information with the private sector unless they're authorized to do so. In many cases, that authorization has to come from the National Command Authority. Uh, you can imagine if, if suddenly DOD was doing all of these things, the outcry from, from civilian uh, or, or just the, the government itself would be massive. Uh, there has to be, a, by nature of our Constitution, there has to be that control over DOD, but there's lots of constraints when these issues happen. So I, I see that as uh, probably uh, the biggest issue that I think uh, that, that uh, DOD would be facing. Um, one of the other areas is that anything NSA does, anything that uh, U.S. Cyber Command does uh, of any significance is very classified. And there's just not a whole lot of folks in the private sector that, that maintain those, cla th those, uh, those certifications, those security clearances to be able to gather that information. So all of a sudden you have this information gap just because they can't share that information as well. In case of a catastrophic type issue like what we're talking about here today, uh, this would be called a homeland defense issue where the actual national sovereignty of the United States would be in question. And uh, once again, this would have to be authorized by the highest levels, the National Command Authority, um, and DOD would be part of the mission but would not be directing the mission. Now, for those of you who have done anything with the military, you know there's a couple things that they always talk about, and that's... Um, <clears throat> unity of command, unity of effort, those issues that go with that. And military folks are always talking about how that comes together. Unfortunately, in this scenario, as what we've seen in a series of war games that we've done, is that none of the big three, Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, are really established as the lead agency. They each have their sectors, they each have their responsibilities, but there is no chief belly button, if you would, uh, to who's responsible for all of those things, can lead to those areas of, of uh, real problems when, you, when you're talking about unity of effort. Uh, so that those would be those issues. Homeland Defense mission, again, established by the highest level, the bringing upon of, of uh, the capabilities of Department of Defense. But remember, there's that law that we talk about in our classes all the time called Posse Comitatus that really is so restrictive of DOD doing anything against U.S. citizens. I agree it needs to be there, but we need to consider and we need to come up with some policy on how, uh, how we're going to do that in case of emergencies, which leads to my next point, and that is, Right now, due to a real paucity of, of policy at the highest levels, and, and where that was discussed earlier, we don't have in DOD any standing rules of engagement. We don't have that list of, if this happens, do this. That doesn't exist. So almost everything the DOD would do would be based upon either uh, supporting Homeland Security or would be waiting for some authority to come and say, this is what we want you to do. That, that's a problem, and I, I think that that's where uh, we really need to get to um, for the <clears throat> as we move along this maturing of the cyber threat as a part of uh, our Homeland Defense, Homeland Security. Uh, finally, just let me say that uh, um, we have found in our war games that um, from, the, from the civilian sector, there is a basic mistrust of calling the government in until uh, in, in several of our war games, uh, until it's too late. When suddenly you're at a catastrophic place where uh, you no longer have anything, the private industry has no longer anything they can do, then they call the government and say, fix it. Uh, that's, a, that's a problem. We need to be working together. And I will tell you that this organization, uh, the InfraGuard, and those ISACs out there, those information sharing and analysis centers that DHS coordinates with, those are the pieces, the places where relationships are going to be developed. That's where we're going to make the most money in putting this together because without a policy, without issues, without specific missions established, 
you're going to have to work based on the relationships that are developed at, at uh, organizations like this. So uh, I want to I want to really commend the uh, the InfraGuard organizations and those of you who are involved with ISACs because that's how we're going to do this is those personal relationships and crossing those barriers established by policy. Thank you. Bill, we have a lot of work to do. We do. Uh, our next speaker is Trent Chyna, who our distinguished uh, FBI cyber leader in the National Capital Region. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Trent Chyna, and I'm, I'm the ASAC over the cyber branch of the Washington Field Office. First of all, I'd like to welcome you to Washington, D.C. on behalf of the Assistant Director in Charge, Valerie Parley. Can you hear me in the back better? Okay, I'm getting here. Uh, welcome to Washington, D.C. It's uh, you're, you're just in time for the rain and the storm coming this weekend, but welcome. Hopefully you get a chance to see our sites. Uh, what I'm responsible for with the cyber branch, and uh, I have a bit of a long view, is if it has to do as a threat to the critical infrastructure or has a spark or any digital component, um, my groups want to uh, investigate it. So here in D.C., the way we're set up, you had uh, Pete Trahan that welcomed you from our headquarters component earlier. I run the actual field investigations for the National Capital Region and Northern Virginia. So basically, I had a colleague of mine that when I ran the NCIJTF, always said that you know, usually we'd come out and do these threat briefings and tell you what the risk is and and actually come out and say, no, I'm here to do a victim notification. Because usually if you're in the, the National Capital Region inside the Beltway, it's a major uh, target center for cyber attacks from, you know, all kinds of different uh, characters and we're the ones investigating it. Uh, with that, we work very closely and usually getting into what our role is and kind of giving the perspective of what the FBI does vis-a-vis uh, -vis DHS or DOD, we're the investigative component. Uh, we have 56 field offices across the country, 66 offices around the world, and so we're the investigative arm for the Justice Department, and we're closely tied between our each office's cyber task force looking at uh, cyber attacks against critical infrastructure, and then also tied closely with our joint terrorism task force. So what we do is we meld both a cyber attack and a physical attack against those um, critical infrastructures to investigate it. We work very closely with DHS and DOD. Um, so when you have a call to one, you have a call to all. Uh, and it's good to set the, the stage on what our roles are is because when we get involved, we're actually investigating, trying to find out what the, the threat is or the attack and starting to mitigate it and then pass that information over to our partners at DHS, either working with FEMA, the NKIC or the different components so that we can do resilience and protection. Our investigation part also then feeds into what the Department of Defense needs and or even the states and governors so that they can protect from an attack. So whether or not it's an individual group, a hacktivist, a state sponsor, a terrorist group, because when you come down to you know, getting down to the cyber attack, the tools and techniques are the same. It's usually the motivation of the actor. So when you're trying to exploit a, a system that's run by a computer control, you're basically trying to get that system to do what it wasn't designed to do, and then you're just trying to exploit it via code, physical, or you know even the EMTP attack to make it do something it wasn't designed. And we're going to try and figure out who's responsible and then trace it back. Um, again, thank you for having us come out today. I um, look forward to answering any of your questions. I think that's well under five minutes, and turn yeah. it over to my colleague from DHS. <laughs> Yeah, we're making up good time here. Montana, please. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm uh, Robin Montana Williams. Uh, I am the branch chief uh, for our cybersecurity education and awareness branch and uh, lead uh, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, uh, which focuses on an entire national program to, to, do, a, to do really three things raise awareness of cybersecurity uh, from K through gray, as I say, of how to do good, do good hygiene as an individual on the internet, good practices at home, good practices in the workplace, uh, and to understand, understand that you're at risk in that environment and you're exposed to a lot of different threats and keeping that awareness up uh, to be safe. Uh, it's really no different than locking your home, wearing a seat belt, Oh, you can go to a variety of different things that people do to mitigate risk. Uh, the second piece to that is broadening the pool. 
which involves really enhancing and creating an environment where more and more people are entering the cybersecurity workforce. Because in the bottom line, uh, all my colleagues did a really good job about talking about the policy and the integration and how the necessity is to work together and that especially within the federal government, the three big gorillas, DOJ, J, uh, DOD and DHS, have, have, have very different mission or different responsibilities when it comes to cyberspace and their roles in cyberspace and working together. But you cannot execute those responsibilities if you don't have the right people. So it centers around, and, and, and I think the, the threat and every piece of cybersecurity uh, centers just as, you know, a lot of people talk a lot about the software and the technical component and the hardware and those pieces of cybersecurity, but that the essence and the center of most of our problem is the human part of it. And I will, I will, I will, I will ask this to the audience, and I ask most of my audience, if you can, if there's any single person in this audience that can tell me that the APT, the Advanced Persistent Threat, used some sort of fancy laser and busted through all of our network systems and got in, come and tell me. Because that's not how it happened. It was a social engineering event. A human let them in the system. And that's where the problem is. So you go from the awareness piece to broadening the pool and then finally um, evolving the workforce. So one of, one of, the, one of the things, in, and we've, we, this was on the radio again this morning, people are still talking about it, is the cybersecurity workforce across the country, there's really no defined pathway that takes you from what I refer to as hire to retire. So how do you grow a cybersecurity professional? Organizations don't have workforce development plans in place. What happens is poaching. Is one company goes and targets another individual from another company, offers them more money, offers them an opportunity to, 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 to be promoted, and there becomes this secular cycle of folks, or the cycles, a secular event of things happening where people just move from job to job to job and you can't keep your best and brightest people because you really don't have a workforce development plan. And so our office within DHS and the NICE initiative, that is the centerpiece of what we're trying to do. So we are approaching this problem. I mean, DHS has many, many roles and missions in cybersecurity. Uh, from what was just described earlier of what our, uh, what the NKIC does, what the U.S. CERT does on the technical standpoint, but also we see this as a bigger problem of actually helping and making sure that the front lines uh, uh, out there are, are, we're getting the right people, we're getting the right skill set needed to defend our networks. And um, one of the key aspects of this is the fact that um, if we don't raise the bar of our existing workforce, we're going to continue to follow further and further behind, and we're going to continue to lose this war. And I'm sure, I'm sure many of you read all the numbers, anywhere from $366 billion of known property loss, intellectual property, and criminal events alone, you know, every year of cost. So this is an epidemic problem. You've probably heard numerous, various reports. We need 300,000 workers in this career field. We need 1.7 million workers world globally. You know, additional workers in this cybersecurity career field. So the idea really, our center of what I'm really trying to do is to grow that. Organizations like InfraGuard, the, state, the Governor's Association, we, we have tools and we have programs that we can work together to help a state. For example, the state of California right now is looking at expanding, you know, uh, uh, looking at really defining their workforce. So they're using the National Cybersecurity Framework. How many people have heard of the National Cybersecurity Framework? Okay. So some of you have heard of NIST, the framework, the, the, the cybersecurity framework that way. The National Cybersecurity Workforce Framework, which I want to, uh, I want to introduce you guys to, uh, is uh, what we've done is we've looked at the 31 key functional roles that occur in cybersecurity. And we're, and we're asking both government, the government's being, being mandated by OPM right now, uh, and, and OMB to, uh, to, to start building their workforce and defining their workforce based on the National Cybersecurity Workforce Framework. 31 functional roles with the associated KSAs at the functional level of what people need, what, what knowledge, skills, and abilities are needed at, at those levels. And so that, that exists out there. 
uh, there's, we have tools and things that are, that are sitting on what is called the NICS portal. And you guys can Google this, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Careers and Studies portal, which is a resource that is available to anybody from a parent to a governor to a CEO uh, to a human resources person to a cybersecurity to a CISO on tools that they can use to help develop and train their workforce. Uh, based on the, the the workforce framework itself, so there's there's a critical infrastructure. There's a couple. There's things that are going on right now from the critical infrastructure framework that NIST is working on, uh, that came out of the EO all the way to the to the workforce framework, which is helping feed uh, the opportunity to feed the opportunities for uh, folks who are in this career field. Uh, so um, I'll I'll stop there, and we can we can start to engaging and answering questions, but. I, what I want to reiterate is the fact that the workforce and the human aspect is just as important as policy, just as important as the hardware and software, and it's an issue that we need to continue to address and it sometimes I think is neglected uh, by, by people who are thinking in this lane of the road. Thank you. A lot to think about. Um, panelists, do you have any questions to, of other panelists? Do you want to add anything from what you heard? Bill? Yeah, I want to address my question to Tom. I guess I should look at him as I... <laughs> and that is uh, one of the areas that we as a work college are moving toward is the development of um, how the National Guard Title 32 forces integrate into the cyber workforce, perhaps from a Title 10 DOD perspective, but maybe more significantly how that would affect the, the, the governors and the governor's capability of doing that. Have you guys done any kind of research or work in that area? Yep. Uh, so what we, um, a, a number of years ago, was actually set up under President Bush what's called the Council of Governors. It is 10 governors appointed by the President of the United States, and it, is, it was ostensibly designed to focus on DISCA and to look at unity of, of effort, unity of command issues with respect to DOD, DHS. Um, and so the, the, those, those principles are at the table. And uh, a couple weeks ago, was at one of the staff sessions of those with DOD, with DHS. Um, I think DOJ at some point will be brought into it. And we're looking right now specifically at defining the mission space for cyber between states, DOD, DHS and, and so forth. And in fact, we're actually working toward uh, a, a, an agreement, an MOU or something, uh, some similar vehicle, similar to what we did for DISCA. Um, and that is really going to help define the mission space. It's a starting point. It's going to help begin the discussion um, uh, of that. And it's going to help, defi help, define, help define that. Um, it is a big and very complicated issue. It, it brings in Title 10, Title 32, the role of the National Guard, budget issues. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated negotiation discussion um, that uh, when the governors, we bring the governors together twice a year, and when the governors come together in February this year when the council meets, um, that will be topic number one that we're going to be working on. So, so uh, um, I, if I could throw out a, out, out a question uh, or two Frank, responses, is that fine, Frank? Sure. Um, so, so two responses just to provide, I, 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 got, I got kicked in the shins by, by one of my colleagues who's here that, that, um, that one of the things I didn't mention is that we at NGA, you know, one of the focuses that we are looking at is that notion of developing a skilled workforce and what tools governors have available to them. So, so I want to I wanna just make sure that you're aware that we're working, we're aware of, of your tools, the nice, and, and we're actually pushing that framework out to states. But the question I want to ask is to our, to our FBI guys, and one of the things that, that we are also emphasizing to governors is expanding the role of fusion centers in the cyber, in the cyber world. Um, we've seen, you know, there's, there's a few fusion centers that are out there that are beginning to, to, to stand up some capabilities, and I'd be interested to kind of hear your take on, on what you see their role with respect to fusion centers. For those of you who don't know, there's 78 fusion centers out there. They're designed, they were originally designed as uh, to, to, to collect information around terrorism. The mission has involved, there's been, uh, uh, the, you know, a, a, ma a maturation process, if you will, with respect to some baseline and the beginning to move into the cyberspace, and I'd be interested to hear your, your, your take on that. Uh, well, you know, with the fusion centers, I think what we need to do is uh, they need to evolve, and they have begun evolving, is not just a straight terrorism, counterterrorism mission. 
but actually getting into that information sharing and actual response. Because what we've seen both with our joint terrorism task forces, our fusion centers, and then also cyber task forces, our, our, our membership are from state, local, tribal, um, as a part of that. And through that, we're able to share. You know, in, in some parts of the country, the fusion centers are, are like uh, actually models and working amazingly well. Mm -hmm. Others, uh, they need to mature. And I think that's the, it really, right now, from what I've seen in my experience, it depends on the area and the involvement, you know, by the state and locals, how successful the, the fusion centers. Some have that their framework and they're passing information. Other fusion centers are just, you know, putting points on the board right and left where you're, it's a great, it really is doing what it's supposed to be is you're getting all that information into one place and then being able to share it. Yeah. And, and that's always the trick is sharing that information. Because coming down to it is really 90 some percent of the information is really un open source or mm -hmm. unclassified, maybe law enforcement sensitive. But it's, you know, it's a very small percentage is actually classified, which that ends up slowing everything down. And once people, you know, and we've seen it over the last two years as the government's gone away from, you know, getting tied up in the, you know, the classified or overclassified information and sharing the information that's, that's just out there. And that's, and it's that speed of information and building that speed of trust they have this success. And right. I think that answers your question. The, just to okay. add a little bit to that, the MSI SACs and stuff that we've worked with our partnership with the FBI, and, and, and Trent's correct. There's, there's certain fusion centers that are just awesome and some just need a little bit of work. So one of the things DHS is really trying to do is get, get gather up best practices among the fusion centers, share them, work on a common taxonomy. Because sometimes there's this lovely language differential of, of terms that different people use. And, and so when you're talking to somebody at the U.S. CERT or you're talking to somebody uh, at the Joint Task Force for the FBI, the, getting, that, getting that right dialogue so everybody's on kind of on the same page, looking at ways to train everybody to, the, to, to some basic level uh, within the fusion centers, uh, and so they're getting some of the training that some of the government folks are getting because this is an infrastructure. Those are some of the things as we move forward over the next few years that we're really trying to push uh, within from DHS's perspective also. You know, but Go ahead. Oh, so, no. so but, but on that notion, I mean, isn't one of the biggest challenges to, to some of the information sharing, it, it, it's, it, it's like we take fusion centers is that you know, the cyber mission space still isn't well defined. I mean, it's defined there, but it's defined within a law enforcement culture. And so you have the CIOs and the CISOs in the states who aren't law enforcement and, and often can't get access to. And then you also have the issue with private sector entities who may not trust, who may not want to share. And so you know, how do we begin to overcome some of those things where the cyberspace is a, it's a law, it is a law enforcement issue. It's a critical infrastructure issue at times. And, and it, but it also kind of, you've got the CIOs, the chief information officers or the CISOs who have this enterprise-wide view but may not be in the law enforcement culture. Mm -hmm. And there are barriers that, that, that they need to break down. I'd be interested to hear any of the panelists' reactions to that. So, so on that, I mean, that's exactly true. But I mean, the way to, the, I mean, the most success we've had is through InfraCard. I mean, a lot of this is, is building that speed of trust and actually bringing them in. I meet with C-suite level individuals all the time, CIOs, and actually getting it past, you know, getting them to our InfraCard coordinators, getting them on a, on a first night basis. So when they have an issue, I spend most of my week getting hypothetical calls from CIOs and CISOs <laughs> and saying they have a problem. And it's, it's building that, really, that, that speed of trust. I keep going back to it so that, you know, there is that myth that, you know, you call law enforcement and then you have the FBI show up. There's a whole bunch of raid jackets. Same thing with DHS. They're going to show up. You have a whole bunch of government types that are going to slow down the business. And that's not what we're here to do. It's actually a lot of the conversations I have is, hey, I heard something's going on. What are you hearing? And, and it's literally both ways because is this a real issue? Is there a new DDoS attack going on? Is there a new zero-day exploit going on? You know, that may not be directly to their infrastructure or their uh, enterprise, but you're having that dialogue, and, and it's growing. I mean, the maturity from, like I started our uh, Los Angeles chapter of InfraGuard, you know, 15 years ago, and been involved in it on and off during my career, and just the, the maturity that we've gone for, it, it really is. But it's still, it's like our fusion centers. They're, they're, you know, like, you know, Baltimore and D.C.'s chapter, I mean, really, it's a model of the nation. How I'm always so, so impressed at how involved our membership is, as opposed to other chapters where they're just meeting once a month and, you know, not really as engaged. But it, it's that. So, you know, that.
that your point is exactly right. Depending you call the DC office, you call another office, you may not get the same response. Um, DHS in Montana, you probably go into this, is, you know, it's more centrally located here in DC. They have the PSAs across the nation. Again, it depends on the outreach and you're not always going to, we try and give them the same response, but you have to build those culture and bring it in. I mean, it's, a, it's an excellent thing to highlight. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's relationship building at its core. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, you know, with our, we, you know, we have our PSAs and now we're starting to infuse CSAs, which are our cybersecurity folks out there. You want to explain we, PSAs? What's that? Sorry. Explain PSAs. Right? No, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, uh, you know, our PSAs work, our, work with our critic, work, work, work critical infrastructure, and our, their, those are our agents out in the field. Uh, they're assigned right now to the, the FEMA regions. It's built on the FEMA construct. So there's PSAs located all over the country, various large cities that have, uh, that have, a, that have a need, or there's, some, there's significant activities going on there that really affect critical infrastructure. Uh, and you can go, uh, you can get, get on the, the DHS website and find out points of contact for your PSAs. The cyber folks, we just have a, like four or five of them, um, is I think all we have right now, distributed across the country. They're overwhelmed. We're trying to get more billets uh, to put more folks out there. I'm really working hard for the Las Vegas job. I'm publicly announcing that right now. Uh, but uh, uh, so I can actually see my wife more than like two days a month. Uh, but um, the... Uh, the job for them is actually that is exactly that is working with all the other government agencies and linking with the private sector, working with academia. It, it expands across the entire community and not just including the, the 16 or so 17 critical infrastructures uh, to, to basically help solve problems, provide points of contact for people to reach to. Uh, and, and as, as was just, was was just saying, it's, it's got to be a relationship building where there's a trust that's established, where companies are comfortable coming to, uh, a, you know, somebody from InfraGuard or somebody from you know, a specific agency and sharing information and knowing that they're there, that's protected. You know, remember, you know, when you're dealing with the, pro the uh, uh, private sector, you know, it's, it's all about stockholders and it's all about their reputation. It's more important for, an or, for a private sector organization, their reputation is actually more important than anything and their brand. Uh, so, you know, they tend to stay close hold on a lot of that stuff. But we found that over time, as different events have happened, and there's a benefit of this information sharing uh, among the various companies. And, and a lot of companies are coming around and wanting to participate more. But that's d d driven a lot in a lot of cases, in mo and even with most states, is on the personality of that PSA or that CSA or that InfraGuard chapter out there that's creating this involvement. Uh, so it, it really comes down to, you know, adopting these good ideas, adopting, you know, good, good hygiene practices, adopting good information sharing practices. It, it all works together and it's very, unfortunately, per, you know, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, because in cyber, you know, we don't tend to, a lot of geeks don't like to be outgoing and be engagement folks. But that has to happen. And so you have to have people out there who are engaging, building, and developing relationships. Great comment, the comment, uh, Montana. I want to shift to Trent to ask him about information sharing between the FBI and membership in InfraGuard and others. Oh, okay. Um, well, I want to give a – okay, so InfraGuard, if you're not a member of InfraGuard, I suggest that you join. It's free. That's my free pitch here. Uh, it doesn't cost anything, but what it is is it's the mechanism by which the – you know, the Justice Department, FBI has set up to do, infra, you know, the whole purpose of InfraGuard when it started was infrastructure protection. Um, and cyber is a big component of that. But it, it's the mechanism by which the FBI specifically uses to push threat analysis and uh, tippers, queuing, the whole thing out to the community. And that's really grown over the time. We closely partner with DHS and um, over there. So, like, when we're investigating something and I, I discover a new uh, – threat, a new zero day, a new compromise, a new attack, we're going to push it out through our InfraGuard network first. InfraGuard, so it's a background, if you're not a member, as you join, we do a light background on you and you, it's kind of a, it's a closed network so you can share information behind the, the fence line, but we can then quickly push information out. 
So when I get threat information, not only do I push it out to the InfraGuard network, I'll push it over to DHS and then have them push it out through their network because the way I like doing that is so I don't, if I have an investigation going on, I don't want to tip that the FBI is investigating this. So I push it out through the normal networks that, and, and DHS is amazing and their reach as they go out, they're pushing it out through the normal feed, which I recommend, you know, it's like uh, Patch Tuesday. Pay attention to that because a lot of the investigations that we're working and the other investigative agencies, we utilize DHS to get that out. And that's how you're going to be able to know that the threat's out there. A little bit on protection going into, we have, we have a, through InfraGuard, we have a reporting portal called iGuardian. iGuardian is the network by which you can report threat information securely to us. It comes, it's immediately actioned out of headquarters and then assigned to the field office so that we can start going on these threats. So it's everything, and it's not just a cyber reporting. It could be, you know, somebody's acting suspicious. It could be everything from criminal to terrorism to counterintelligence to cyber or across all of those. And, you know, iGuardian is that portal by which you can uh, enter that information and we can respond. And then basically, it, as I mentioned before, a call to one is a call to all. That's one of those intake points that you kind of usually get is who do you call? Do you call Montana? Do you call me? Do you call the governor's associate? I mean, who do you call? Once we get it, we try and share it between all the, all the uh, organizations so that you have awareness. And then it's usually the back office calls, okay, are you looking into this? Yeah, I'll get back to you. Or what do you know about it? Is this a real threat, as I mentioned? Or is this just one of the 1,000 DDoS attacks that are going on every day? That, that's one of the reasons to be involved in InfraGuard because it's, it's a way for us as an organization to push information out to the, the um, public. Okay, uh, time to go to the audience. Um, yes, sir. Who had a question first? Okay. Please identify yourself and then. I'm George Baker, and, and uh, uh, Professor Emeritus, James Madison University. Uh, uh, EMP and RF weapons have been called the ul ultimate denial of service attacks. And uh, I was wondering what, to what extent do you include those effects in your planning and your, your programs? And I'd be interested to hear from any or, or all of you. Well, I, I can say what we do at the FBI. So we work very closely with D DHS, ICS, CERT. So we have agents that we train specifically for that. We send them through Idaho National Labs. Um, they're usually part of our um, regional deployment teams. And so when you see, see it's, when you say cyber to people, you never know what that means. You know, depending on what the rubric going into it is, you always have that filter. For us, it's like for protection of critical infrastructure, we have agents that are trained that uh, appreciate, you know, like I said in the beginning, we investigate threats against something that has a spark usually and that's going. So EMP is a real, or RF weapon is, is a real threat. So we team up with our domestic terrorism um, teams and our uh, IT teams and kind of look at it as a holistic team. So when there's, when there's an issue, usually a call goes to both us and DHS or we call each other and then you have a blended team that's going out to it. So I, I don't know, have you guys seen Make Magazine? It's on the newsstand. So basically Make Magazine, it comes out monthly and it's, based, it's uh, an engineering magazine so you can make robots and all kinds of interesting with electronics. This month's issue actually has stuff on making your own personal EMP device and how to do it and give you the schematics. So, you know, as you're talking about it, it's not that hard, but, you know, it's, it's out there on the net or on the newsstand on how to do it. So the, the, the range of characters that we investigate are, you know, everything from fringe to nation state. And so, I mean, it, it's definitely in our training and what to do because like an EMP and our pulse against electronics is usually very bad. And then how to respond to it. I don't know if I... Remember. No, that's... Exactly how it works. No, you want to go please. The bad news from the DOD side is, although they discuss EMP, they don't really talk about what they're going to do when it happens. At, at least at the War College level, uh, it's going to be. We had a we had a war game a couple years ago that discussed all of those areas, and and uh, the uh, the EMP scenario was basically. Uh, beam me up, Scotty. Uh, I have uh, no no capability. So, um, yeah, it, it's not well covered at at the war college level. I mean, there's so many other issues that go on. I'm just glad we can at least get some cyber into the war college curriculums. But uh, uh, that that's definitely a, a future topic as uh, 
somebody identifies that this really is a problem at a level well above me. Yeah, I'm an XB52 aviator, so in the DOD it was all about the delivery of EMP. Yep. We have another question from the audience, unless somebody else was going to answer uh, that other Bill, question. Okay. I want to ask you about power plants on bases. Is there a program that's moving along on that? Like, you wanted to, to uh, reduce reliance on the public's, uh, pr private sector power plants by building uh, utilities. Do you know anything about that? It's not cost effective. Okay. Uh, I will tell you that. Uh, I know that the uh, Corps of Engineers and uh, some of your uh, engineering capabilities across DOD are aware of the fact that if when this happens that they will run their generators until they run out of fuel. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you that there is no real program that says we're going to create our own uh, energy generating capabilities so that we don't have to rely on the, uh, the private sector. That, I, don't, I don't think that program's out there. I could be wrong, it's but I don't think so. It's not cost effective. Okay, we have one final question in the back here. All right, I'm a student at UMUC, Karen Angosier. I'm curious about the human aspect. Um, you might have the best firewalls, um, the best security system. What about um, internal human aspects in, um, say, government that could create leaks on cybersecurity well, issues? What are you doing about that? So. So, you know, you, you read all about it in the press. And, <clears throat> and if you ever spend any time with Kevin Mitnick, who, uh, is the, who, is, who coined the term social engineering, and if you don't know who Kevin Mitnick was, he's actually the first person who was ever prosecuted and spent time in jail under the Internet, uh, under, under internet crime law. Uh, he's one of my neighbors down the street in Las Vegas, actually. And uh, he will tell you that you can spend a billion dollars on cybersecurity. It just takes one stupid human trick. So we'll, uh, we'll put David Letterman in the whole phrase here too. Uh, stupid human tricks. Um, the, really, the, the, the essence of that is we have in the, you know, probably the greatest fear, and if you, you know, insider threat is one of the greatest fears to most government uh, or our DIB type organizations, or even, you know, even your targets or your, or your Sears and Robux. It's somebody inside who has access and can do undue harm. Uh, so it, be, it becomes, it be, part of that is training and awareness uh, for your entire workforce on how to recognize the insider threat, uh, to uh, also, you know, deter it. Uh, one of the things, um, I wrote a paper a while back on, on the idea of, of what happens in, in workplaces. There's a various things that occur in workplace with cyberspace. One of them is cyber slouching, which means you just sit on the internet all day and you don't really work. Uh, and that never happens in any organization I've ever been involved with. Uh, but uh, part of it is, part of that core essence is when, you, when you're looking at the human, human being, you know, what are their motives? Uh, you know, being able to kind of identify, you know, some of the, some of the organizations do a little bit of continuous monitoring with inside their organization of what people's activities are. Uh, they block things. There's things that you can do from a policy standpoint. But you have to deter those type of actions. And many companies do not have an, most, like almost 80% of all uh, civilian uh, or private sector companies do not have any type of internet usage policy in place in their organization. And it may even be higher than that. I'm probably being very conservative when I say 80%. It might be closer to 90%. Do not have a policy. So if you're doing something bad on the company's network, what is the, you know, how are you punished? What, is the rep what are the repercussions other than a slap on the wrist or a little bit of a scolding or anything like that? So. The, if, you're gonna, if you're going to drive human behavior, remember this, it involves consequences. There has to be a consequence for action. You know, I hate to say this, but we're all kind of still children when it comes to this. And so unless you get your hands slapped once in a while, or it hurts, you know, if you, you only have to stick your hand on the, on the burner one time, and you probably remember you're not going to do that again. So it, it really does boil down to a policy set in place by organizations, whether they're government organizations or private sector organizations, that there is repercussions for, for, for negligent or mal, malfeasance activity on the internet. It's bottom line. Just one quick comment, if I could. Please. 
one of the smartest things DOD did in the last five years concerning this issue is they are now holding commanders responsible for the things that go on in their commands. Yeah. This is not just a, a sparky, you got it, or um, a, a, what people would know as a six, the communicators folks. It's the command responsibility. Um, just, uh, just real quick, one minute. So, for the, from the governor's perspective, you know, we're pushing this notion of creating a cultural of awareness. And, and you can see it manifested in two states in particular, Maryland and Michigan, where the governor has, they've instituted, Governor Snyder has pushed out a brand new training package for all state workers. It's an online thing. He takes it, he asks his cabinet members, hey, have you taken the, the, this, this various uh, pod? Um, apparently it's effective. Maryland has taken the same approach. And, and they're also looking at ways to actually make that part of the review process, not just the ticking of the course, but other, other kind of things as part of like a, an OPM type policy. That's a benchmark. We're gonna take the Michigan program and push it out as hard as I can nationally. That is a, an incredible program. But you know that's from a that's from a governor who used to be a, who has a cyber technical background, so he has a love for this. So he's so he's building, you know, he's he's setting the standard. Governor Snyder is, and it's a great program, shining right. example. So go talk to go talk to the Michigan is it Lorman, is it Lorman? Dan. Dan Dan. Go talk to Dan. Get a hold of Dan and get the program. He'll share it with you. Uh, any state, any organization, any business, they'll share it gladly. Use it. Good program. Carved out for states for governors. <coughs> what should they be doing to? Um, protect their their own assets. What they what actions should they be taking to recover? And so, with that in mind, we launched the the resource center with that notion of filling that policy void for governors for state actors. Because from our perspective, they are an essential player to mitigating, to responding to, and protecting from any type of cyber attack, even if it's in the hands of a privately owned critical infrastructure. And I know that's the the topic of today's theme. Um, and, and so toward that end, we've spent, um, we put together a, a group of, an, an august group of folks who have helped us think through what is it that governors can be doing. And governors are busy. They think high level. They think strategic. And so what we've issued is a call to action. We issued earlier this month, or rather earlier this year, uh, at an event at Capitol Hill. Uh, Governor Snyder came down from Michigan. And we call it a call to action for governors on cybersecurity. And we recommend that states take five basic steps, and we call it act and adjust. It's the notion of don't let perfect be the enemy of, of good and done, and not done, maybe just, maybe just good. Because right now, um, the challenge is that the, the, the threat landscape is ever evolving, it's ever changing, and there are things that states can begin to do now to effectuate as forward-leaning a cybersecurity posture as possible. And so that's the mission space we're in right now. We're looking at posture. We will eventually move to looking at response issues, which takes us to the discussion here today. We don't care at NGA if it's an EMP, if it's a solar, if it's solar weather, if it's cyber, um, improve their cybersecurity posture. The thing is called the call to action. Um, I, I think I got like maybe 30 seconds left. I'll just tell you the five actions that, that we've, we've at, we're advocating for states. One is this notion of creating a risk awareness culture. Two is this notion of understanding your own risk your own threats, your own vulnerabilities. Three is really improving how you, um, you do continuous threat monitoring. Um, then there's also this notion of applying uh, standard business practices. In particular, what we point to the, the, the SANS top 20 critical controls. It's no longer SANS, it's now Council on Cybersecurity. So the, the, there is a document, it's high level, it's focused on governors, it seems light, but it's not. It's, it, it is a strategic piece that we have put together for governors. It's really that notion of, uh, of improving the posture. We are going to be looking over in 2014 to begin to look at response issues. So I hope that uh, helps set a little bit of the stage about where, we, where, where our thinking is at the NGA and, and um, really looking to expand the role of governors and states. Thank you, Thomas. <clears throat> Bill, please. Well, good morning, and I bring you a greeting from the Army's best-kept secret, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, home of car shows and the Army War College. Uh, great place to be from, and uh, I always remind myself that uh, working in Carlisle, the worst day in Carlisle is a 10-minute commute with one stoplight. So when I come to uh, come to D.C., it always gives me that perspective of where I work. So anyway, just just glad to be here today. When I was Chuck. 
Uh, good morning. I'm Frank Kesterman. It's my privilege to introduce this distinguished panel. I've looked at all their bios, and rather than say anything about myself, other than I'm probably the oldest InfraGuard member in the room, but uh, I've found that these four people, with all their important responsibilities, all contribute some of their time to youth education, mentoring, and development, which I thought was really quite, quite remarkable considering their busy lives. Uh, the order that we're going to follow, we'll have a five-minute per panelist protocol, followed by a minute or two where panelists can ask questions to each other or to add comments that they maybe now could remember when they previously forgot. Uh, and then we'll throw it open for questions from the audience, and please introduce yourselves with your questions, and we'll try to get answers for you. The order of the uh, speakers, and raise your hands because you're not in the order that we had you on the list. Uh, the first speaker is Thomas McClellan, Director of Homeland Security and Public Safety Division at National Governors Association. He'll be the first speaker. Uh, Bill Waddell, Director of Mission Command and Cyberspace Group, Center for Strategic Leadership and Development, U.S. Army War College, Carlisle. Pennsylvania. Thank you for coming down here this morning. Trent Tyma, FBI Washington Field Office, Special Agent in Charge of Cybersecurity, former Director of Cybersecurity Policy, White House National Security Staff. And Montana Williams, Chief National Security Education and Awareness, uh, responsible for the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. Our first speaker is Th Thomas. Great. Thank you, Frank. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's tough to follow all the technical panels because I don't know anything in terms of the, the science of all this. Um, but let me tell you what my area of focus is. So I work with an organization called the National Governors Association. We are, we're an organization that's comprised of the 55 governors uh, out in the states, and I oversee what's called the Homeland Security and Public Safety Division. And in my role, I get the opportunity to work directly with governors as well as their Homeland Security Advisors, some of their Emergency Managers, Adjutant Generals, Criminal Justice Advisors, around a range of issues. And uh, I've got a short time here, but I want to provide to you an overview of a project that we launched about a year ago under the leadership of Governors O'Malley from Maryland and Governor Rick Snyder from Michigan. It's called the, the State Resource Center for Cybersecurity. The idea was that there's a lot of discussion taking place, and I'm gonna tie it into some of the earlier discussions we heard earlier, uh, before. There's been a lot of discussion around cybersecurity taking place, but it's all, frankly, been focused at the federal level. You have DOD protecting the .mil space, we have DHS protecting the .gov space, but there hasn't been a role yet, seismic, if it's a cyber attack, with respect to the electrical grid coming down for any prolonged period of time. What we're gonna to begin to look at and, and, and are starting a process within NGA that's gonna probably um, align itself with our Cyber Resource Center is this notion of response. How do governors, A, understand the primary, secondary, and tertiary impacts of a massive and prolonged failure of the electric grid. But then what are the response? That mission space is also undefined. Right now, um, it, one of the major concerns among Homeland Security Advisors is this notion of catastrophic planning. What happens if something really big goes off in New York City? How do you evacuate Manhattan? How do you get the hospitals out? So the corollary to that is, what happens if the grid goes down? We had a, a um, not a corollary of that, but a part of that. So we had a governor's only discussion back in summer of, of this year, and one of the discussions that we had was this notion of the response to Sandy and, and other major catastrophes, tornadoes and so forth. And one of the con top concerns for governors is energy assurance. And you know, without, without electricity, you have no comms after, after a certain amount of time, you have no fuel after a certain amount of time, you can't heat, you can't cool, and so it's really been a major issue. And Sandy was big, but it isn't as big as some of the things that, that, are, that are possible out there. You know, one of the biggest threats I think that we face as a nation with respect to cyber, in addition to the financial, is this notion of the electric good being taken down or, or, or seriously impact, impacted. So we're gonna be looking at NGA um, to provide governors with advice, with resources. We're helping states right now 